Welcome to Gotta Run With Will. My name is Melanie Eversley. I'm your host for today. I'm executive editor of Black News and Views, which is a news website. I'm also a lapsed runner healing from injuries and a running history enthusiast, uh, particularly when it comes to Black running history. But that's why it gives me great pleasure to introduce my guest today, Dr. Pam Cooper Chenkin, a sports historian, doctor of history, author of the American Marathon, and also researcher for an upcoming book about New York City's Black running clubs. Uh, let me also just say this is part one of a series of interviews because we've got a lot of material that we want to bring to you. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to you, Pam. How did you first get interested in this subject? When in the 1970s, I belonged to the New York Roadrunners, mm -hmm. and the person who started encouraging me was Louis White, the great marathon runner. I knew him quite well. He was a friend of mine, and he encouraged me to write the whole history of the marathon. And the second most important person was Valerie Levy. In 2013, I met her at the dedication of Ted Corbett Way. And when she found out who I was, her whole face changed and she said, my husband loved your book. And after that, I wanted to write more about the New York Pioneer Club. And that led me to do more research on black track clubs and black runners in the 20th century in New York City. Okay. And let me just mention, Ted Corbett is considered the father of yes. distance running, first president yes. of New York Road Runners, Olympian in yes. the Helsinki Olympics. and. Ted Corbett Way is in Marble Hill in the Bronx. Yes. Yeah. I met Ted Corbett a few times. He was encouraging, but his son, Gary, definitely propelled me on the route to write this second book. Yes. Right, uh, right, right. What I found out at first studying it is, well, the New York Pioneer Club was an integrated club. And I found that that track and field in New York City has always been integrated. Now, black runners didn't have any power or any authority, but it was always integrated in the 20th century because New York City schools were legally desegregated by 1900. They abolished the black schools. Now, the, there was always and still is de facto segregation. Right. But the black schools were abolished. So essentially, by law, the system was integrated. Mm -hmm. And shortly after, the Public Schools Athletic League began in New York City. Right. And that was a series of all types of athletics, including track and field. Mm -hmm. So it functioned as kind of a farm league right. for the sports clubs. Yeah. It's so interesting how, um, you know, and this is something I found in running even to this day. Yeah. It's like on the, the running track and, you know, on running paths, you find things are a lot more advanced racially than in the real world. You know, yes. it's almost as if, um, you know, athletics is kind of leading the way or people are using yeah. that to set an example. Well, part of the reason was the way sports were structured. I mean, we will come back to this. But in order to go to the Olympics, you had to be part of an AAU club. Mm -hmm. But there were no black AAU clubs in the early 20th century, very early. In 1904, when George Pogue went to the Olympics, becoming the first black Olympic runner, mm -hmm. he belonged to a white track club. That was the only way he could get there. Right. right. The great runner, J.B. Taylor, yes. who was from the metropolitan area, got to the Olympics in 1908 mm -hmm. by joining the Irish American Athletic Club. Yeah. And the headline in the New York Times read, J.B. Taylor to run as an Irish American because <laughs> that club would accept, the Irish American Athletic Club would accept people that the New York Athletic Club would not accept, very simply, African American and Eastern European Jews. But there were no black track clubs until 1904. Probably the first black track club in New York City was the Alpha Physical Culture Club. Mm -hmm. And that was started by a number of middle-class men who were very interestingly Afro-Caribbean. Mm -hmm. They were mostly from the islands. One of them was Robert Douglas, mm -hmm. very famous for the Renaissance 
basketball club. Yeah. He was one of the founders. The Normans were also the three brothers, mm -hmm. also from the islands. Okay. And they started the Alpha Physical Culture Club really as because of the terrible conditions in the black community, mm -hmm. the overcrowding, to develop health among African American right. youth. Okay. Mm -hmm. Over in Brooklyn, another club started. The first fully independent African American basketball team, the Smart Set Athletic Club, featured players from a tight knit group of Brooklyn's most affluent and well educated blacks. Smart Set Home Games featured popular jazz and ragtime orchestras bringing people together by creating meaningful and empowering social events. The Smart Set Athletic Club, one of the game's original pioneers. And that started about 1905. And that was a little bit different. That was the established black middle class. They modeled it on the Dowager New York Athletic Club. Yeah. These were both adhering to the rules of amateurism. Remember, the Afro-Caribbeans had a very strong track and field history mm -hmm. from the British, and they were proponents of amateurism as much as the New York Athletic Club was. So you had these two track clubs starting by middle-class men. Okay. Now, I remember you telling me that the Smart Set, their founder, had a certain claim to fame. Lena Horne's dad? Well, the founders were the Lattimores, but okay. the, the great families like the Horns and the Holbrooks and the Lattimores belonged to the Smart Set. Okay. And Lena Horne's daughter, Gail Buckley, wrote about the Smart Set in her biography. Okay. That it was middle class, that manners and the way you acted was very important to them. And it was also important to the Alpha Physical Culture Club. But they were not allowed into the AAU. They could not be AAU registered. Right, right. They were s simply rejected. Yeah. And other black track clubs started through the black churches. Yeah. One was St. Christopher's. Now, I'm saying track clubs. Actually, these were all multi-sport clubs. Mm -hmm. In my research, I was just interested in track, but they yeah. had... They were multi-sport clubs. The New York Athletic Club was a multi-sport club. And the AAU governed all sports mm -hmm. that would go, you know, the amateurism of all sports going to the Olympics. Sure. So you had St. Christopher's Club mm -hmm. forming from St. Philip's Church, a very prominent black church. Yeah, I, my parents were married at St. Philip's, so okay. I'm familiar. <laughs> I think it started as a Bible study club. There is an excellent book about the formation of these early clubs, The Black Fives by Claude Johnson. Yeah. He mainly talked about basketball, but these were multi-sport clubs. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is that he mentions, and I later confirmed, they were integrated, not heavily integrated, but they would accept white members. Right. St. Christopher's accepted Irving Rose, yeah. And Al Tishinsky. Mm -hmm. He became known by his nickname, Tish. The because family did very well in real Tish. estate later on. Yeah. <laughs> just a little. Just a little. <laughs> and then there was the Salem Methodist Church that sponsored athletics, and they had the Salem Crescent Club. The Crescents were a group of schoolboys who formed a club, and the Salem Church gave them a place, and they were a track club. These were the four major track clubs. Right. of the early 20th century. Did any of them ever face any kind of, um, you know, taunts or discrimination or anything like that when they tried to um, compete with other clubs? Actually, you couldn't compete as a member of a black club. Mm -hmm. So what you would do is, if you wanted to compete in an AAU sanctioned event and go to the Olympics, you could compete as a member of an AAU registered club. Mm -hmm or as a member of a university, or you could sign up on your own right. independently. And usually what the club members would do, a very famous runner, Henry Binga Desmond, was a member of the Smart Set, but would compete independently mm -hmm. in track meets. So you could compete that way. But what was most important was Jimmy Ravenel, who was a member of St. Christopher's mm -hmm. and the PSAL and won in an AAU sanctioned meet because he was in the public schools athletic league and the AAU did control high school sports. Yeah, yeah. And he competed and 
won a 100-yard dash. These clubs were very active, especially the smart set. They were culturally very prominent. Right. So they were agitating for membership in the AAU. It was all written up in the New York Age, and the first one accepted was the smart set in 1914. Okay. So you could now belong to an AAU club and compete in the Olympics. Okay, all right. Which you couldn't do for the 1912 Olympics. Fascinating. It's funny you should mention the New York Age because I have an uncle who was a correspondent for them. Uh, but this is the first time I, I've heard anybody mention, mention the New York Age in conversation, so this is pretty cool. But. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I love the paper, and they had a whole write-up on that. Of course, I have the photocopies at home. Yeah. And they would also write up um, the integration of smart set events. Mm -hmm. When, you know, these were social clubs as well. They would have galas. The smart set events were attended by white people yeah. Yeah. as well. And um, the club St. Christopher's, they did have a track club, and Ravenel was a member. They, they also had a basketball club, and they admitted Irving Rose. Mm -hmm. And the New York Age gave him a pretty good write-up. Yeah. He was really the mainstay of the team. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So do you think that all of this unity and this acceptance, did this uh, kind of uh, bleed or spill out into other parts of life in New York at the time? Because as we know, things were in some ways just as divided in New York as some parts of the South. Uh, no. South. At the time? No. Think okay. of the other important track clubs, like, okay, yeah. there was the Irish American Athletic Club. Mm -hmm. That was integrated. Mm -hmm. What happened was the New York Athletic Club was taking all the good Irish track and field competitors. You know, they were winning at the Olympics. We all remember 1908 and the, the Irish whales competing. Mm -hmm. And so the Irish American Athletic Club had to find the top runners of other ethnic groups. Okay. So as I said, they were admitting African-Americans and Eastern European Jews. Right. What about the Milrose? Well, that was formed about that time. Mm -hmm. Wanamakers was repeatedly criticized for not allowing African-Americans to have positions on the selling floor. Right. Mm -hmm. They were elevator operators. Right. They were also not allowed on the team. They set up a different team, the Robert C. Os Ogden athletic association mm -hmm. which was your typical separate but unequal yeah. track team which was eventually disbanded mm -hmm. by the aau right uh for being insufficiently funded and that's something else that's important mm -hmm. if you have a track team you've got to have a source of funding yeah the dues of the members of the of the athletic members aren't really going to go that far right New York Athletic Club had some of the wealthiest men in the city. Sure. And I think you have a picture of their enormous their clubhouse. Headquarters. Yeah, beautiful. The <laughs> Irish American Athletic Club had the persona, you know, of being this scrappy and streetwise club. Right. And they were tweaking the New York Athletic Club by adopting as their logo the winged fist, mm -hmm. whereas the New York Athletic Club had the winged foot. But being on a team did a lot for you. You got coaching. Mm -hmm. You had facilities. The Alphas had a, had a clubhouse with right. a well-supplied gymnasium. You had facilities for training. You had coaching. You had travel expenses. You had somebody deal with the bureaucracy of arranging for, to get you into a meet. Mm -hmm. But something else was going on, and Claude Johnson covered this in The Black Fives. Wealthy, influential men who backed the club could help you get a job. Now, this was before people went to college. Wanamaker's was funding Milrose, mm -hmm. and athletes were glad to run for Milrose. You got a job. Right. The smart set, the men could help young boys get a yeah. job. And the churches were even mm -hmm. better because they could help you get into college and help you fund it. Mm -hmm. The people who came to these clubs were um, driven, not just in terms of athletics, but in terms of 
all sorts of walks in their lives. So yes. a lot of these athletes who we're talking about were um, accomplished in not just one sport, but, yes. but many. Yeah. They went on to become great businessmen, great leaders. Harry Bright, who passed away recently, yeah. was a member of the groundbreaking New York Pioneer Club, was president of the New York State Association of Human Rights Commissions, executive director of the White Plains Human Rights Commission, and councilman for White Plains. Harold Norman, one of the founders of the Alpha Physical Culture Club, yeah. became the chairman of the AAU Tennis Committee. Oh, gosh. Mm -hmm. All very accomplished. Yes, yes. Lattimore's were very prominent. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Judge uh, James Watson, yes. one of the first elected judges yeah. through the Democratic political machine. Mm -hmm. And that was something else that the Afro-Caribbeans were bringing to sports. In fact, sports and politics are kind of intertwined. Interesting. Can, can you talk about that? Well, James Watson ran as a Democrat. Remember, in the, at the turn of the century, there was a certain sentimental attachment to the Republican Party mm -hmm. on the part of African Americans. Mm -hmm. But the Afro-Caribbeans didn't have that sentimental attachment. Right. They became Democrats. Yeah. And the Tammany machine was part of it. Mm -hmm. The Tammany, the political machines often help with the funding of athletic clubs. Interesting. You also were talking about um, the, the Caribbean influence and what the um, Afro-Caribbeans uh, brought to the sport and brought to the clubs. Can you um, talk about that a little bit more? More Was this something that they brought from their home countries? Or um, I know in the neighborhood where um, my grandmother grew up, a lot of pe people knew each other from the countries that they came from, like from Jamaica, in, in my case, and from Barbados. Um, and they, they kept those ties and helped each other in business. Is that sort of what oh, Those are countries with a here? very strong track and field culture. Okay. And, a, and as I said, a very strong ethic of amateurism. Yeah. So they kept the amateurism alive and yeah. very, you know, the prestige. Of, they brought the prestige of track and field. Okay. That, that was a prestige sport, sport. Yeah, yeah. I remember you also talking about fraternal clubs, a number of the Caribbean yeah. Americans joining fraternal yeah. clubs when they came here, and that kind of led uh, to them. If you were middle class, you joined clubs, mm -hmm. because usually the middle class were entrepreneurs, okay. and it helped you that way. But black men joined clubs because it was part of survival right. that you had those ties, you had people who, who would assist you. Mm -hmm. So black men did, did join clubs and form clubs. Right. Um, it's interesting, there was another group. There were, New York City is the center of the black diaspora and of the Jewish diaspora. Mm -hmm. And those two immigrations, the Afro-Caribbean immigration and the Jewish immigration were happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. And by 1920, there were about a million and a half people in Manhattan who were Jewish, Jewish descent. Mm -hmm. So this was a big group. Right. I think it was about, I'm guessing, about a quarter of the city's population. Mm -hmm. The black group was about, I think, 157,000. That was okay. 157. One okay, tenth. so about half of about one tenth. About, okay. Of the Jewish of the Jewish wow. group. Okay. So this was another group that there was a lot of interaction. Yeah. Both Tushinsky and Rose. Right. Were part right. of there, especially in the public schools. Remember, both groups were outsiders. If yes. you were Eastern or Southern European, if you were Italian or Polish, the Catholic Church was there. Right. So you weren't totally an outsider, but these both groups were outsiders. Yes. So there was some sort of in, some sort of meeting, mm -hmm. and um, especially in the field of sports. Yes. An, another yeah. group formed about this time, well, 1915, mm -hmm. and that was the Grand Street Boys Association. Now this was formed of very well-established Jewish men who had grown up in poverty. Mm -hmm on the Lower East Side, Jonah Goldstein, who became president, I think in 1933, spoke of his boyhood on the Lower East Side. And he said, it wasn't that we didn't know any better, it's that we couldn't afford any better. It was six people living in two rooms. Mm -hmm. 
But most of these people became good. Goldstein became an attorney. Mm -hmm. And they formed the Grand Street Boys Association, which was very interesting because it wasn't just for the Jewish community. Right. From the very beginning, they decided this would be a social welfare organization. It would reach out to all groups. Mm -hmm. Now, the majority of the members were Jewish, mm -hmm. but one of the charter members was William Robinson. Yeah, William Bojangles Robinson. Mm -hmm. Right. Who right. was, okay, he became famous as yes. a dancer, but he was mm -hmm. also a track runner. Right, right. At that time, that, that part of Manhattan was pretty diverse, wouldn't you say? There were um, a good good number of members of the black community living there. Yes, and, yes. Mm -hmm. Although the black community was moving to the mid of the west side, San Juan Hill, okay. and, and moving up to Harlem by then. Okay, they, okay. But enough so that there would yeah. be they would yeah. look to um, the Grand Street group as, as an outlet. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about Bill Robinson's time with the club? He would appear at track events to run backwards. And he would be in races running backwards where he could still come in ahead of runners running forward. Was the purpose of that just to kind of show, hey, was, I can do this backwards also? Or what was part was of better conditioning? Part of the or, because these were big social events. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I remember Robert Douglas in 1966 complaining that people didn't go to track meets. But at this time, this was part of the social event. Right, right. And there were social events after. What I find important was that the Grand Street Boys um, in the early 1920s gave Robinson a donation of $1,000, which was big money. A lot of money back then. <laughs> for a specific Harlem charity. And I found this out through the New York Age. Okay. It wasn't mentioned anywhere else that um, I could find. What was the charity? The Katie Ferguson Home for Unwed Mothers, okay. which has to do with the mores of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's a lot of money. And that's why I'm looking now to see what kind of funding they did for other, other black other groups. Other groups, sure, sure. I'm just curious about your research. Were you able to talk to any folks who were still still with us who remember any of this? How did you come across uh, um, a lot of this material? Actually, it was establishing relationships with the librarians at the New York Public Library. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, the Milstein Collection, which is local history, people okay. would show me how to find things. Okay. So this was, and sometimes it was going through the New York Age page by page. Yeah. So how did the pandemic affect that? The pandemic was wonderful because they <laughs> let you access everything from home. Okay. And the well, New York Age great. was digitized by then. Right. And Claude Johnson in his book also mentioned what a delight it was. You could stay at home and you had everything right. for you. Right, right. Yeah. Is there anything that I haven't brought up that you, you think would be important for folks to know? I think what you see in this stage is the first steps toward getting agency for black track runners. And those first steps were getting to be AAU clubs. Mm -hmm. And in 1917, the Salem Crescent Athletic Club won the uh, Metropolitan AAU competition in track and field Okay. over the white clubs. Okay, very cool. At this time, I'd like to thank my guest, Dr. Pamela cooper Chenkin. I'm Melanie Eversley. Thanks to Will Sanchez for the opportunity to host. Um, also, a special thanks to Manhattan Neighborhood Network. And don't forget, gotta run.